Yeah. Hello. Just a quick uh, request from all of you. So please mute yourself. Uh, I see that uh, Jose Paulo, you are uh, not muted. Uh, please. Oh, yeah, you're already. OK, thank you for that. Uh, of course, guys, so uh, if I just started with the mute on mute thing, uh, let me uh, just uh, quickly raise your attention to the point that during the whole webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, stop wherever I'm uh, at the presentation and raise your questions, okay? Of course, time by time, I will ask you if you have any questions at the really end of the webinar, I will also question, ask it from you. Uh, but if you have anything to add, if you have anything as comes up as a question, please feel free to, uh, to stop me, okay? So uh, let's be interactive as possible. Uh, so again, Justina, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so uh, how it's been said, I'm Thomas Bekashi representing EIT House. Of course, within COVIDx, I'm representing COVIDx, uh, but I'm coming from EIT House, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, uh, specialized, our brand specialized for uh, life sciences, especially health related topics. Uh, and I'm uh, responsible for certain countries and uh, 70, uh, 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 let's say member uh, startup program portfolio within Europe. Uh, so we are, uh, as COVIDx is doing as well, uh, we are keen to support uh, early and uh, more major startups uh, in their journey. So uh, in the recent years, uh, I mentored a lot of startups uh, and in my previous life, whenever uh, I worked with multinational companies uh, and my background mainly is business development, marketing and communication. I also supported startups. So altogether, uh, uh, there were times that I, I listed how much startups I, I mentored. Uh, approximately now I reach 300. Uh, so I worked with a lot of startups. Of course, uh, some of them one times, so many of them uh, were longer term. So, uh, and I really like to work with you uh, as startups because I truly believe that that's the, the most uh, valuable and impactful part of my job. Okay, so uh, of course, further on, let me also uh, drop the idea here. So if you have any questions uh, later on regarding the webinar on any other topics, of course, we will have uh, a mentoring session. So we can also discuss it there. Uh, but bet in between, after, if you have anything I can help you in, or you're interested in any type of opportunities, please feel free to uh, contact me via LinkedIn, uh, drop me an email, uh, message to Justina, and Justina will message me. So every channel can work. So please feel free to, to ask. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen uh, and jump in the middle. I believe that you can see my screen, but what I'm not sure is that you are seeing it in a full screen. Do you see it in a full screen? I, I don't see it full screen. I only see like the... Oh. Yeah, I don't know what's happening with Zoom, but uh, recently if you are sharing not your screen, but uh the uh just the window itself then it, it it's not switching to full screen even though you are pushing the button uh i believe that you are now seeing it in full screen yeah no yes, yes. cool okay thank you for that so uh you know just really as a kind of preword for my presentation uh so the mentality of marketing so that those are the points i would like to quickly go through it's important that marketing of course, is a tool set. Marketing is an approach. Marketing uh, is a kind of philosophy, but mainly uh, what we can call marketing is a mentality. It's not about, you know, just giving you a life realistic example. Marketing is not about how much post we are releasing. It's not about how much money we are actually spending in the social media or how much we are paying for a PR article or how often we are participating in a professional event. It's all about how do you see yourself? And if you are uh, handling marketing in a proper way, then actually it will reflect to all of your business parts because it's more about, uh, let's say, how do you, again, how do you see yourself? How analytic, uh, let's say, thinking can be integrated uh, to your everyday business flow? Now that's actually also part of marketing because if you, if you cannot make your uh, analysis, your evaluation internally, so you cannot, you, you know, we can simplify uh, this point to a SWOT analysis. So what is your internal capability? What are the strengths you need to build on? Uh, what are your competences and what are your assets actually available for running a marketing campaign or uh, actually having 
uh, a final sales result. Now that's something you would definitely need because without that, you cannot have in 90, 90% of the occasions, you cannot have a proper marketing campaign, a proper marketing strategy, first of all. Uh, it's important to mention here uh, that I'm highly sales focused uh, on the marketing side. Of course, I work in different fields of marketing, uh, but especially uh, I know that you are in a different phases of your journey, uh, but especially for the startups who are in the, let's say early phase, uh, maybe you already have revenue, but not that much. Uh, you need to, my, my opinion and my recommendation just in advance, that only use marketing activities which are directly serving your sales purposes. Because if you are talking about building up a brand, image campaigns, everything else which is not directly serving sales, it's a kind of luxury for early stage startups or early stage companies. Of course, whoever is having multiple locations, not just in maybe not just in Europe, but outside of Europe as well, it's a different thing. So of course, you always need to adapt to your purposes, to your, to your competences and capabilities, and of course the maturity levels. So that's important. But getting back to the mentality uh, of marketing. So these are the most important statements you can read out from the slide. So first of all, uh, do be customer centric. Yeah, you should not talk, so marketing and in general, your business flow should not talk about yourself, your aim, your goals, your needs. Everything is based on the customer needs. So what is their needs? What are their, let's say, capabilities also from budget perspective? Uh, that will decide that actually what type of marketing activities can be impactful towards them. Uh, the next one is don't start with tactics, start with objectives. So it's marketing, if it's going well, it's a supporting function. It shouldn't be an individual function, uh, like, okay, independently for your, from your business perspectives, what would be a marketing strategy? It's a really bad approach. Marketing should serve your business objectives. So first, find your objectives. Uh, the next one is, do you get to know your customers, care about them, delight them? It's more about account management because whenever we are talking about marketing and sales hand in hand, of course, it should be hand in hand, first of all. The second is that whenever you already have the customer, you need to actually handle them, manage them. And it's unfortunately, unfortunately, it's up to, uh, it's up to how we see it. It's not enough if you are serving your customers. You need to make them happy. You make to delight them, especially whoever is working on the B2B segment. Of course, B2C is a little bit different, but actually delighting the customers is quite common in both ways. But especially if you have a certain amount of customers, big multinational companies, hospitals. So actually it's not that atomic market than the B2C, then it's really, it's actually an essential thing to keep them. Because if you have 20 customers, two are just going out, then you're in trouble. Of course, if you have you know, 10,000 users and two are out of the game, you can still survive. That's a different thing. But of course, the methodology and also the attrition methodology behind the customer moving is different. So if you are doing your job well, a B2B customer is more likely to, to, to stay uh, than a B2C customer who is like, for instance, a digital health solution by unsubscribing uh, the application or unsubscribing the service is just, you know, two clicks uh, and out of your service. Uh, so the next one is uh, everything should be done easy for the customers, not just entering to your service, but actually using your service, working together with you, uh, paying for you. So all the stations, they are actually living together with you. It should be easy and should be user friendly. An important message, I would highly underline it. So then sell features, explain benefits. That's important in a sales situation that uh, many of, I mean, many of you, many of startups in general, especially in the life science field uh, is led by, and it's not a problem, don't get me wrong, but led by uh, actually pro professionals coming from healthcare field, which is not a problem or engineers, uh, but again, not a problem, but a different state of mind. So uh, usually, of course, technical uh, details in a certain level is needed, especially for a B2B customer. And it's always important to mention here that you should adapt uh, your arguments, your, your different uh, selling points to your audience. So if you are speaking somebody in Roche, for instance, uh, who is leading, uh, let's say, uh, the research unit, 
of course, you will need to have somebody who can at least who can be uh, interrupted uh, by the uh, by the technical details. But if you are talking, for instance, an operational manager of a hospital, who of course has some professional knowledge, but they are usually operational guys, so they are just interested in how, uh, let's say, on an operational level, finances and resource point of view, your solution can help them. Now that's a different type of narrative would be needed. So it's important that by, based on the audience, you should always adapt your sayings, your main uh, points, but in general, uh, the saying is right. So you should highlight the benefits, not the features, because you should translate it uh, to benefits. Um, and it's important, uh, marketing, how I just started, can be your best friend or your worst enemy as well. Uh, meaning that if you are not selecting uh, the tools and actually the, the, the whole approach of marketing adapted to your, to your current uh, life situation or your company's life situation and, and possibilities, then it can occupy a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of money, most importantly. So you should always be careful uh, with marketing, especially in the early phases, uh, because again, it can help a lot, but it can make a lot of damage, especially from financial basis. Uh, you can see uh, actually the Scott Straton's uh, well-known saying, so marketing is not a task, marketing is, a depart is not a department, marketing is not a job. Marketing happens every time you engage or not with your past, present and potential customers. So that's also aligned with my previous point that actually sales, account management and marketing should be hand in hand, but especially sales and marketing. Move forward. So actually the three main takeaways from today. Uh, so actually uh, the, the plan, uh, uh, on the plan side, uh, you need to have a well-defined strategy because if you do have, and it's important, the second part of it, if you have a well-defined strategy, you should not stop there. You should actually translate it to actions. But if you have well-defined strategy, then it will dictate the activities. If the action plan coming out uh, from your strategy will be much more easier than if you have just some ideas about what, what, what would be your marketing cornerstones uh, and, and how your strategy would serve your aims. Uh, the focus, it's important uh, for, for me personally, it's one of the hardest things to, uh, to adapt to uh, is that do a few things very well. So of course, in our life, in your business, in your company, there are so much possibilities, so much opportunities, so much leads coming to your way. Uh, we can say it's an optimistic scenario because sometimes you know, we are so keen to find these opportunities. But you know, as Murphy's uh, rules are saying, uh, so whenever you have an opportunity, of course, you will have 10 others in parallel. So for that reason, but of course, uh, you have limited resources. So for this reason, you need, to wise, uh, you need to be wise on that and select carefully what are the things you really want to do for your business and do it very well. Focus on those because you, you are not able to, to cover 10 different fields by your own if you have one or two people. Uh, of course, I'm not saying you should not be opportunistic, uh, but, but you should know your limits and within those limits, try to be focused as possible and measure. So this is what people usually hate. And also communication, marketing specialists are just hating because nobody wants to face with the reality, but measures are making you uh, to do so. Uh, because first of all, uh, my recommendation, again, especially for early stage startups, uh, because of the reason that whenever we are talking about image campaigns, brand uh, building related uh, campaigns, it's pretty hard to measure. Uh, so, and it's almost impossible, even though there are some methods uh, usually these are highly theoretical. Uh, so, it, you know, whenever you are running an image campaign, it's pretty hard to measure back how your image actually been improved because there are no measurements for that. I mean, the real one. But if we are talking about especially sales driven uh, or sales uh, oriented marketing activities, you always just select the ones which can be measured back, which can be uh, really, ten which can be translated to something tangible uh, which you can count and measure it. Uh, because otherwise you cannot really say or, or you cannot really make a reflection that did you use your money, energy and resources, other resources in a wise way. And there is no lessons learned about it because of course it's not a problem 
if you are doing something which you are measuring back, it's not good. Uh, it needs to be improved. You have a decision based on your, of course, cash flow uh, and your aims that do we want to continue that activity? Maybe it will be improved, but let's see how can we can improve. Or maybe after one or two months, you are just terminating that activity. It's not a problem. So, uh, so it's always, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm telling you something which is pretty straightforward. So we should learn also from our failures. It's not a problem. I mean, of course, it's, it's easy to say from my chair, if you are spending like one or 2,000 euros for something, which is not bringing back the, the value. So the return of investment is definitely on a negative scale, um, but at least you learn from it. So I know at that time you are losing 2,000 euros or maybe 20,000, maybe 200,000 euros. It's not really, you know, uh, it's hard to say that, hey, at least we, we learned something. But when times fly, you, you will recognize that definitely you learned something out of it. Uh, and, and of course, you should learn from uh, out of it because uh, if you are repeating the same mistake, and that comes with the first point I mentioned to you, if you're unable to, uh, to measure something, then it's a high chance that you will repeat your failures. If you're able to measure and learn from it, then it's less a chance to, to make the same mistake. Okay, the agenda for today, um, yes, guys, you can recognize I can talk a lot. And yes, that was just an intro uh, of the webinar, but I, I uh, promise you that we will go through in approximately an hour with all the points. Uh, so you can see the agenda that first we are starting with personal messaging, then the strategy versus plan, the KPIs, funnels, and then uh, just a quick overview of what are the most uh, common, let's say, marketing activities uh, specialized for healthcare, but then actually split it into the two, let's say, typical groups, digital and analog marketing, and then just, you know, a quick wrap up at the end. So far, do you have any questions? Okay, no, not yeah, from really. my side, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, please go ahead. No, no, not from my side. I mean, ah, it goes okay, to okay. <laughs> doing great, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So, actually, uh, the person the messaging. So, it's important to know who are your customers. And whenever I'm saying who are your customers, uh, actually, it's not about that. Okay, for instance, I, I just raised this example, Roche. Roche is a big pharmaceutical company. You know, we can say uh, all the uh, most important things about Roche, where they are located, how much rent, etc. It's not about that. It's more about the persona behind uh, your customer. So actually, there are certain level of positions or roles within Roche, for instance, uh, who would be the decision makers in your uh, case. Uh, but besides their roles and positions, we need to find the person behind it. So we can, of course, we are all different uh, uh, and it's, uh, we are all unique, like the, 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 the old saying uh, is stating, but of course there are certain characteristics uh, up, onto the, up onto the persona uh, we can define, which would be a great asset to fine tune our marketing approach. And this is mainly about the messaging because of course we are, whenever we have the objectives, what we would like to achieve uh, by the marketing activity we are planning, <clears throat> we should see who is the target group. And for the target group, uh, if we are able to go deeper down, then we can fine tune the message and also the channels. And the channels can be really relevant from the, also from the budget perspective, because maybe you are thinking something which is quite trendy. Let's just bring here social media, uh, which is a typical good example that how an originally good, let's say marketing asset can be a huge uh, money sucker. So actually on social media, if you're wise, if you know what you would like to do with social media, who is the target group, what you would like to say to your target group, then it can be a huge help. If you want to do like an image campaign that, hey, we are here, now that's something I totally not recommending uh, because that's just waste of time and energy to be honest, and money, of course. Uh, not for all of you, but most of the occasions, that's, that's, what, that's a valid statement uh, because it seems to be that in social media, I mean, managing a campaign, set up, setting up a campaign and then managing a campaign is pretty straightforward because the platform and the console is pretty user-friendly, but it's not like that. First of all, on the, on the planning side, you need to make a hard work. 
And for running the campaign and setting up and running the campaign, you also need to have proper knowledge. Uh, these are the PCR, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, PPC, PCR. Oh my God, so COVID. So yeah, <laughs> sorry for that. So it's PPC uh, experts who is uh, taking care of this. And even though, for instance, Facebook or LinkedIn uh, 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 campaign management sites are pretty straightforward, they have the proper knowledge and the experience, what are the do's and don'ts. And whenever you are paying for these experts, actually you are paying for that type of knowledge, not because of you, can, you are not able to setting up the, the campaign by its console. You are paying for the experience and actually the red signs, they already know. Uh, so that's important that, that social media can be a good example for that. Uh, but first of all, uh, knowing your customers, uh, maybe, uh, of course, I know that, that again, different maturity levels, different practices, but most of you, I believe, would still have, need to have more interviews with your potential customers. So my first suggestion is uh, listen to them. So actually try to organize as many uh, informal or formal interviews, even though you don't have, so especially if you have, don't have the product, try to organize as many informal interviews as possible uh, with your, based on your surroundings. So you most probably have co-workers, uh, 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 you know, it's uh, lesser mates or, or friends or families who are knowing people who can be, for, who can be helpful for you. Uh, here, I need to mention uh, that if you are about, or if you are already running interviews, um, which would be essential uh, upon to my experience, uh, that you are, it's important that how you are asking questions and what type of questions you're asking. Uh, just a quick round question for all of you. Uh, do you know mom test as a methodology? No. Okay. Yes, I, uh, I personally do. But if I may ask a question before that. Sure. Uh, I mean, um, you mentioned to interview people from your surrounding or if you, do, you have a couple of people in your surrounding, but people carrying this disease are not uh, to your reach. So how could you um, reach them? How could you engage them somehow, knowing that all the associations that have these blockers uh, where it's very difficult to, uh, to, um, to interact with them directly as a startup? Yeah, so, okay, so let me, let me answer uh, first for this question. So, first of all, of course, uh, you have different regional uh, or European institutes like the IT House as well, who can help you in this. So, if you need uh, this kind of special type of audience you would like to interview, uh, then you can always turn to these associations, these organizations, and they can help you. So, that's one thing. The other is, of course, I mean, not specifically uh, for special type uh, of patients, but in general, if you want to talk with people, decision makers, patients, etc., who is not reachable at the moment for you, you can also uh, wrap it up uh, as a kind of service, meaning that you are organizing, for instance, a webinar about that disease, let's say, and you are inviting people, you are inviting associations. And then you can also, so if you are talking about the online world, uh, you can also use matchmaking applications there. So actually you can <clears throat> start to schedule one-to-ones uh, with, the, with, with the participants of the team. So uh, that can be in my uh, daily routine, let's say, uh, <clears throat> that can also work very well because if you're offering, to, if offering something is that, hey, we're inviting two, three keynote speakers and then we are making a kind of matchmaking, not specifically for the patients, but maybe the care holders, maybe for the associations who are dealing with them, then it's a good way ahead making connections with them. And if you, you are in contact with a patient organization by this way, uh, then you would have much more easier task to, uh, to involve their patients to your interviews. Perfect, thank you very much. Sure thing. Uh, just getting back to the mom test, so whoever is not familiar with mom test, is actually it's a methodology that who should, your, who should uh, you formulate your questions. Uh, it's about, you know, if it's the whole methodology is based on the, the, the situation that whenever you have, you know, like a new innovation 
and you're asking your mom, hey mom, do you like my innovation? Of course, your mom will tell you, hey honey, of course, I like you. So avoiding these kinds of distortion uh, by, by, by raising the, I mean, the, not the bad questions, there is no bad and, and good questions, but the ineffective questions which are making distortions on the answers. Now that's mom test actually, how to avoid this kind of really, even though you don't want it, sometimes we are, most of the occasions, uh, we are uh, actually directing our questions in a way that we are having the answers we would like to have. And that's nice thing, but especially if your money, your energy and your company is depended on that you need to have the right answers, not the, not the answers you would like to have. So MomTest is helping you to create the questions uh, which are leading you to the real thing. So not the, again, not the answers you would like to have or which is close to your heart. So MomTest, if somebody is uh, uh, arranging interviews in the, in the future, I highly recommend it. There are many articles, studies, books about it. So you can easily find it. Okay, uh, so again, getting back to the customers, this is a, uh, an example for B2B companies. Uh, we are now making a distinguishment between purchasers, users, decision makers, influencers, and enablers. These are the biggest groups of people actually working for that company you would like to make business with. Uh, and it's important that you should, uh, so first of all, as a group of people, you need to identify that what they, how, and what they would like to, <clears throat> I'm sorry, losing my voice. So what is the purpose? They would like to uh, purchase a new product or service. What is exactly they are looking for? Uh, where they are looking for? and how you can make the, the communication link with them. So those are the most important perspectives you should realize. And if you are going into the details, so purchasers are the guys who's got the budget, the authority, but they need, uh, I mean, uh, they also got the need and timing uh, for the buying. The users, of course, usually doctors, uh, if you're talking about life science products, uh, uh, they are actually the ones who will actively uh, used, uh, use uh, your products and services. And also they have the opinion whenever the, the, if there is a purchasing department or purchaser, they are asked uh, about the product or service. So that they are also important uh, from the opinion or reputation perspective. The decision makers, usually these are the hospital uh, uh, directors or the purchasing director or operational managers or if, of course, up to which type of organization we are talking about. If you're talking about pharmaceutical companies, these are the department managers or department directors. So they can also have the actual signing power. So which has been proposed by the purchaser, he or she will be the final person who is making authorized. Okay, so influencers. Uh, so actually on the users, the decision makers and purchasers, less likely the purchasers, but usually the users and decision makers, they are the one who can make actually a kind of impact on the decision. That can be also an external body, an external like patient organization or any other organization which has a solid uh, connections on that manner uh, with your customer, uh, but they definitely can make a final word uh, on, the, on the decision. And the enablers, so they are your leads, actually. They are your indirect connections to your customers. They're able to introduce you and they are also able, of course, the, to, to help you uh, to manage the relation. It's not their duty, although. Uh, so usually enablers are just part of this whole process at the really beginning. Why you are not starting to, to have discussion uh, with a decision maker or the purchasers, so the other personas you are looking for. Okay, customer profiling. So these are the most important uh, aspects. Uh, you, should, you should check so who they are, how they think, what they do, where they operate, what are their pain points, and how they are purchased products. It's important, guys, that even though uh, that there is, especially multinational companies, pharmaceutical companies, healthcare providers, uh, and especially, of course, governmental hospitals, uh, where we all know that the purchasing cycle is can be really long as well as the contracting cycle. That's really important. Again, I mean, for all of you, even though you are a more major company, that's still important. But especially for an earlier stage company where your cash flow is quite fragile, 
you need to also consider this uh, this uh, this life cycle and the length of this life cycle because uh, if you so if you are planning your finances, hey, on June, I mean, we were out of money at December, but June we already have uh, the memorandum of understanding with Roche, for instance. That's nice, but when the contract will take place and when the first uh, actually payment will arrive to you, that's important to see because even though there is a demand, you have the hand shaken. Uh, there is a contract ongoing on the contractual phase, I mean, ongoing. Uh, if you are not able to receive the first payment before December, then you can be in trouble. Of course, at that time, you can find other resources, I mean, other financial sources, uh, maybe you will, you know, have some smart grants. You know, you will have some national or European grants or an investment. So those are the other options. But if you are 100% relying on that income, will be expected, for instance, from Roche, and the life cycle of purchasing and the contracting will be longer than your survival cycle. Let's say, uh, then you can be in huge trouble. And even though there is a customer, there is a lead, there is the opportunity. You cannot live with that because you're out of money and you need to go uh, for closing your business before it can really start. So it's important to know all of these and especially again on the on the public reimbursement system of Europe, you should definitely count with that factor because sometimes from the contracting uh, or from the final negotiation, you will have one or one and a half years to start to have money from that, that entity, which is a huge amount of time, especially in the innovation. Um, just a quick example, it's nice and shiny. I'm not telling you that all of your potential customers should have this profile by you uh, because, because it's definitely colorful. It has more details, um, <clears throat> more details than it should have, but it's a really nice structure, a really nice overview on the profile. So that's why I'm just bringing you here. Is this for the B2B or B2C, the profile uh, detailed like this? The good news is it's not, not sensitive that it's B2B or B2C because we are talking about people. So that's important that, that uh, of course, for B2B, you need to dig deeper. In case of B2C, it's easier. So there, there of course, always a pros and cons because uh, there are many benefits about having B2C customers because you have the front, let's say, uh, front uh, connection with them. There is not, there is no, uh, a, a big, you know, it's like official entity, like a company, but you can have direct talk with your customers. You can have a direct connection with them. Uh, so profiling is a kind of easier. You can ask questions. You can categorize them based on their location, uh, their education level, their age, uh, everything uh, which is on the marketing palette. Uh, but on the other hand, you have an atomic, uh, let's say, group of customers. Uh, so you don't need to deal with like 20 purchasers, but you need, need to deal with 20,000 individual customers. So that can be the, the, the power of distortion, but profiling actually by categories is pretty much the same. So what would be a different in case of B2C? But answering for your question, this is actually created for B2B, but B2C is not that different because the aspects I mean, the listed aspects are the same, actually. Also, the purchase path is there. So how they can buy your product, which is the cycle of that. Uh, of course, in case um, I will tell you later on, or I will, we will talk about it later on, but also the attrition uh, should be measured in case of B2C and B2B. So again, B2C customers are easier. For them, it's easier to leave the service than a B2B. Uh, but you can also have some, uh, let's say, preparationary actions to avoid it. Uh, so, uh, getting back to the profile, aspects and by categories, this is the same structure in case of B2C. Thank you, Thomas. Sure thing. Messaging. So, that's, that's also important. Again, uh, if you are successful in, uh, in creating, your <clears throat> creating your personas, then uh, you can avoid the situation where when uh, you are shooting uh, to a bird with a cannon. Because if you don't know who you are talking to, I mean, personally, uh, then you can actually create pretty standard uh, overused messages, which is not really bringing the bell uh, or ringing the bell. So it's important that, uh, that you should also face with the fact that marketing channels are crowded. Uh, it's really hard to stand out from the crowd. 
Uh, of course, it does not mean it's not possible. Uh, that's why more customized, personalized, let's say, messages uh, are more than welcome uh, <laughs> because, because this will be your unique and, uh, uh, differentiator from the messaging point of view. But the main rules are, so don't sell something, solve problems. Again, do be customer centric. You need to know what are their problems and you need to, uh, you need to offer a solution for their problems. They are not interested in your solutions or none of them. So they are interested in solving the problems, what has been landed on their tables. If you can offer a solution for that, you are good uh, in that conversation. If you are just wanting, you know, without knowing any of their problems or any of their circumstances, you just want to push your product into, I'm not saying it's impossible. Sometimes it will be successful, but that's a really, really low uh, hit rate, I can tell you. Because of course you should work for demand not generating the demand because especially in the, in the beginning of your journey, you are just not capable for, to do that. Uh, so that's important. The second point, again, about customer centric approach. So don't think about uh, your goals, think about theirs. Again, problems, objectives, what is there? So how can you personally help their work? Because it's important again, that even though we are talking about a big um, uh, multinational corporate uh, uh, company, now let me bring you Novartis instead of Roche. So even though you are working for Novartis, you are a person with a daily routine. You have a boss, you have a condition, you have a seat. And in most of the occasions, and I don't want to, you know, uh, it's not good or bad, uh, but in most of the occasions, employees are sensitive for their seats. They are not uh, waking up with the, the company mission in their heads. So a Novartis employee, and it's not about Novartis, no, it's all for applicable for all companies. They're not waking up, hey, the, uh, my first thing is how I can serve Novartis mission or objectives. No, it's their daily routine to get rid of all the barriers in front of them. And of course, keeping their seats, keeping their, uh, their salaries, making a good job, they're having a recognition too, or just they would like to be professionally good. So uh, fortunately, there is still people who would like to do a good job, uh, not because of recognition, but because of, because of their mentality. But overall, this is their personal aim. And of course, Novartis as a company has its own company. You should consider both of them. And of course, usually these are linked, but not all the time. And it's important that the main trigger for you would be the personal objective of the director, the personal objective of the purchaser. Everybody has its own preferences. Usually purchasers have, would like to have an easy case with the purchasement. So they don't have professional, I mean, besides the professional aspect they need to serve by their own colleagues, uh, they just want to have an easy way to purchase your product. That, then you need to consider how you can uh, <clears throat> help them. Uh, so think about these personal objectives, think about these personal triggers. Uh, it's important that the next message is, don't describe the what, the features. Uh, so actually, uh, again, benefits instead of features. Um, do you focus on the benefits, results, reward, ROI on the outcomes? So ROI, I would highly uh, underline this point because uh, of course, in case of many type of profile uh, solutions you are, uh, you are uh, bringing to the market, some of them are just not because of, uh, you know, uh, uh, economy of scale or not because of saving some or, or generating extra uh, profit uh, for the company. But you all, every time, even though your the product is out of this circle or you think it's out of this circle, every product somehow create a financial benefit as well. If there is nothing else, most probably you will save resources by your solution. Maybe you are automatizing something which is done by manual work at the moment. Maybe do, you are doing something which is done not that effective how you can do it. By this, even though you are not generating extra, uh, uh, extra profit for that company, even though you, there are no people whose position can be canceled because of your uh, solution and can be saved their salary, you will definitely have some savings from time to energy to money. Because every if you can say, hey, by, our, by using our solution, this and that task can be done in half of the time, you save half of the time for X number of employees. That can be translated back to money. Uh, and even though it's not 
a, a realizable money. So it's not that that okay, the company will definitely you know uh, lay off some of their employees and will save their salaries. It's something you can definitely calculate and then demonstrate that you are pitch deck. So whenever you are saying there is no financial benefit uh, uh, coming with your product, that's only saying that you didn't do that with homework uh, for yourself. Um, but you would need to do that because even though uh, you are talking with a hospital, they will looking something also as a financial benefit. Uh, of course, again, the professional aspects, the professional purposes, the professional uh, identifiers or differentiators are important. Sometimes it's the most important, but you should also show them what type of financial benefit you can, they can realize with your product. Uh, and of course, it's important that you should, uh, so financial benefit is one of these things, uh, but it's important that you are, you need to be able to select the best four or five, uh, it's a unique selling point and proposition of value. So what are the most important uh, benefits you are bringing to the table? Okie doke, any questions? If not, then we're moving forward. So strategy, where is the plan? So first, uh, of course, uh, you need to have the, the typical standard, let's say, um, uh, templatized way of creating your, the, your main points, let's say, about your product and solution. So first, that, and of course, for the company as well. So the vision with your service and solution, it can be embedded in a company vision, but it's up to you uh, that you are talking about a product portfolio or you are talking about a simple service or product represented by the company. Then you also need to analyze your market knowledge, how much you know about the competitors, uh, what is your status, etc. And of course, this will go to the SWOT. And by the SWOT, um, again, just getting back to my previous point, the differentiators, what are the most unique ones, uh, which at least are not too represented by your competitors. You don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. Maybe you are doing the same thing than the others, but in a more effective way. Maybe you are doing the same thing, but in a cheaper way, etc. So those can be also differentiators. Maybe there are no extra features, and I saw many projects failing because they were too keen to find or push something into, which is differentiating them from the others. And you know, just some really nonsense feature has been pushed into the product, uh, which didn't do the job, but at the end, it made not that serious uh, uh, from the consideration perspective on the customer side. So it's important that maybe there is no real you know, a special feature which is differentiating you, but at least you need to find something on the business side or on the professional side, which is making this kind of extra, extra message. But it's important that whenever you have these really basics and standard, uh, let's say information for yourself, then you should turn into these long-term goals. Uh, who will we become? Where will we, exist, uh, where will we exist? And how will we succeed? Uh, answers. Uh, it's important, guys, because the first homework uh, you will need to do will be related to these. Long-term goals, I think I don't need to really detail it. You are pretty much familiar with this term. So actually, in a, short, in a, uh, a long period of time, uh, three to five years, mostly five years, uh, what you would like to achieve? Who will it become? So actually, uh, what would be the company uh, what would be the company uh, from the recognition uh, and results perspective you would like to create? So this is the who will we become. Where will we exist? Actually, this is not just a geographical question. This is also a question for yourselves, so funders um, or you know just stakeholders. Uh, what would be your position in the company if those results you are expecting in five years will be accomplished? So actually that's important that, that on a personal level that should be also measured. And how will we succeed? What are your next steps? What would be your key strategy in order to acquire customers or just conquer the market? So what are your high level steps in order to, to reach these results? Uh, I would highly encourage you uh, to, to answer these questions on a team level. So of course you are different, you are various also from size perspective. Some of you has two or three people, 
maybe all the founders are there, uh, but others have already employees, a bigger team. But especially for the core team, so founders, I would highly encourage you to sit down. You know, it can be, a, not, now the weather is getting better and better. So maybe you can go outside from the office, make a one uh, day team building. Uh, I really hate team building as a term, to be honest, because we, I believe that all of us can have good and bad memories as well regarding team, uh, the typical team building. But this is something which is really up to the building. So the team is getting together, you are having fun, but of course, the most important thing, you are making the job. So actually starting to have an open conversation. Uh, what are your future uh, intention about the company? How, what and how would you like to achieve? Uh, that's also important from the founder's point of view. Let me just also highlight another benefits coming out from this practice, because um, uh, if there is no consistent uh, or common intention, uh, at least among the founders, that how would you like to uh, go forward with the, with the company, that can make troubles in the future. Uh, let me give you the example. Uh, I was part of it. I mean, not as a founder, but uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I saw this situation that that the quite early stage startups uh, risk, would have the opportunity uh, to be acquired by a bigger company. Meaning that uh, there was a party who actually came up and say, "Hey, we would like to give you this money for your comp company. Are you interested?" And as unfortunately, the founders uh, didn't have a stable stay, uh, view on that. Uh, so. Some of them would like to sell the company, while others would like to keep it and continue the work. Uh, whenever the money is on the table, it's a really hard argument. So it's really, it was a really difficult argument. Uh, whenever the money is not on the table, I'm not saying it's easy, but at least easier conversation. So you need to have the consensus among the founders what you would like to do with your company in a longer term. Otherwise, it can make a huge trouble later on. Okay, so that's an additional benefit out of this practice. I'm just saying that, that it's also important to talk about it. If there is no compromise or consensus up on the discussion on this topic, you can actually say, okay, let's turn back to it, but you should not forget it because after a while it will come back. And later is always worse in this situation. Okay, vision. So these are the questions again. Uh, it will be a great menu. Of course, these are the typical questions, so you can extend it, you can cancel some of these uh, if you don't like them. But these are the main questions you need to go through with your team, with your core team uh, during the practice uh, to build up a vision. So first of all, what is our purpose? Where is the company in five, 10, 20 years? What's in the, what is the honest end game? So this is what I just mentioned to you as an example. Would you like to you know, sell the company? Would you like to grow it bigger and then sell it? Or would you like to make as a kind of really family company where you can work for, if everything is going fine in the upcoming 30 years? Of course, it's pretty hard to say, especially in these days to, to talk about the next 30 years, but let's be optimistic that the globe will still exist in 30 minutes, 30 years. Uh, so what markets will we own? What spaces will we not try to address? So you can at the really beginning uh, also decide maybe because of the really harsh competition, maybe because of the profile of your product, maybe because of previous experience, that's what are the sectors, geographical locations, uh, uh, different type of uh, customer profiles you would never ever want it to address. Um, and then, uh, who do we want to be? What is the word we imagine? So this is the part where you can a little bit, um, uh, can be a little bit less tangible. So you can a little bit uh, uh, fly, uh, fly around the, the, the toad and a little bit make uh, more philosophical. Um, and the final question is more about your brand image and also about your internal values. That's also important, especially for, uh, for a company who is not that early stage that your company culture should be established uh, because maybe you heard, about, heard the statement that uh, culture eats strategy. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's absolutely a valid statement. So if you don't, especially for a more mature company, if you do not have your internal culture, working ethics, uh, the most important value you are standing for, uh, then even though you have a strategy, every person in your team or most of the person will think different things about it. But if you have a common company value that can also help uh, in an effective implementation of your strategy. 
Uh, so mm, I'm really using my voice. So these questions should be talked through during the practice, and then you can easily build up a vision. Guys, it's important that the vision is not a nice sentence. Of course, we all know that you are going to a company website vision and you see that you know they would like to save the world um, and it's so blah 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 this is the marketing outcome of vision this is the output or external version of your vision so there are two things there is one region which is for you as a company uh, you can be really honest i'm not saying that you know for the outside world you should lie or something like that but this is more a marketing product than about the real deal okay but of course the internal version of the vision would be a good base for creating the external version of your vision. But for that, of course, maybe some of you already have marketing wings, experience, background, etc. Uh, if you do, if you know yourself that you are not that good with communication content or marketing content, I would highly encourage you to, you know, involve. Uh, if you have money, of course, uh, hire an expert or an, or an external uh, somebody. If you do not have or just do not want to uh, spend money on that, you know, if you have somebody around you uh, who's got good communication skills, marketing background, uh, then uh, he or she can make a nice version of the external version of the vision. Okay, so at least on a proposal basis. Understanding the market. Again, the questions you need to answer. What are, like, what are the three, four likely scenarios for the industry? So this is the, let's say, macro uh, frame uh, of, your, of, your, of your surroundings. So how would the industry around you will change in the upcoming years? Uh, where is the customer going? What do they need from us? So what are the demands actually in the market? Uh, you are, of course, uh, in a different lane, but you most probably know that what uh, are the most two most important uh, reason for fair, for making a startup failing. Uh, so the first one, cash flow, pretty straightforward, out of money, you need to close. But the second is really close to the first actually in proportion, uh, is the no need for a specific solution. So many solutions coming from innovators are just not measured in advance on the market. Is this a real need or I just think that it can be a need? It's important, and this is why I really recommend you to make as many interviews as possible, because that's a really good and nice version of validation procedure. Actually, you can explore that for your product, is there any real demand on the market? And it's, and again, mom test. So if, if you are asking a question, hey, do you want to have an application which is actually doing your job instead of you? Of course, if somebody is asking me, I would say, of, of course, come on, give me that, give me that application. But if you are asking that, would you like to buy this application for one thousand euro per month, or are would you be able, or would you like to actually, uh, actually would you like to uh, buy this uh, buy this application, which is actually create or doing your job for thousand of euro? Now that's a different question. Uh, of course, still I like the application. Who is doing my job? Of course, I'm just giving you a silly example. Uh, but it's also measuring that I am able and willing to pay that 1,000 euro, because that's one thing that people love the idea of having something, but the other is that they are willing to or capable to pay for that solution. Because at the end of the day, you are looking for the customers who are paying for you. So not just you know wanting your solution because they think it's nice. Uh, the next question is, where is the government going? What about the private sector? So how you know, the reimbursement system, the regulations is going in Europe. It's something which is, I'm not saying always, but uh, at least on a yearly basis, it's fine tuning, it's changing. Of course, in Europe, we all know it's a heterogeneous um, environment, meaning that different regulation by countries, a reimbursement system can be also different by countries. So that's a really big challenge actually, but you, at least you need to know uh, about your beachhead market, so your first market, first targeted market, and then your future, at least middle term markets. How do you uh, foresee uh, that the regulations and reimbursement system and all these kind of things are changing? Where is the complement, uh, competition going? Why? So what are the trends? What are they doing? Uh, what are the threats you need to count with? Or the, benefit, or the opportunities they are exploring nowadays and maybe can be an opportunity for yourself as well. What the new entrants will there be? 
COVID exit pilot. So actually, it's also important that, that now you have a set of competitors, but maybe in two months time, you will have new competitors, but it's important that they are new on the market, especially you have uh, connections and already customers on the market, you are in a better situation at the moment. But if you want to save this condition, if you want to uh, you know, keep this whole situation where you have uh, stronger benefits in the new entrants, you need to know uh, what are the new things on the market. You need to constantly monitor the market and you need to act on time. Otherwise your benefit, uh, your advantage can be eaten in one month. So it's important that you need to, that's a continuous uh, uh, practice. So that's one time practice as well, but then you need to continue it because that's not just uh, one, uh, telling you too much if you are doing it right one time in a year. So, and what are the social economic, macroeconomic, geopolitical uh, or any other political barriers and forces to consider? So that's, unfortunately, we need to talk about it, especially nowadays, just think about the ongoing war that's making so much impact on innovation and all the business sectors we are working on. So even though it sounds not too direct, especially for healthcare innovation, but it has an impact by the, by the economics, uh, by the future of Europe, et cetera. So that's, that's, that's an important question. We, you also always need to raise, but especially nowadays. Any questions? Okay, Dirk. So SWOT analysis, guys, I don't want to go into details. I believe that you are pretty familiar with SWOT analysis. The only thing which can be added to the, to the standard version, aspirations. So actually the strengths, opportunities, threats and weaknesses can be uh, extended with one more aspect, which is aspirations. So that can be also monitored and SWOT analysis can be done accordingly. Of course, if you, uh, so, so any of you need some more information on SWOT analysis itself, I'm more than happy to go into details, but as we have so much things to talk about, if you agree, I would go forward because I believe that the basics, uh, at least in the SWOT analysis are familiar for you. Okay. Differentiate, differentiation. So these are the, let's say, aspects or sources of, uh, of differentiation uh, you, can, uh, you can see in the list. So first of all, the service experience, the outcomes, the results, the value, the resources actually needs to be, uh, needs to be allocated uh, for, so to, to, to create this product. The features uh, compared to offering, the brand versus the image, the scale and the reach, the equality and elegance. This is of course mainly for more major companies whenever we are talking about the image, the brand image itself, and also uh, the like of uh, so social responsibility and also social reputation for, even though we are talking not talking about fashion brands, uh, but life sciences brands, sometimes in special uh, services and, and products, it still has a role. Uh, to fulfill. So it, it needs to have some, let's say, uh, elegance factor and uh, uh, it's a kind of reputation factor what the customers are looking for. And of course, efficiency structure uh, here in the last uh, point. So you can see uh, that the points of parity and the points of difference is coming from the customers, uh, customer, your brand and the competitor brand, let's say, uh, common group. So you need to be uh, slightly different, at least on your communication uh, from the competitive brand. And of course, it should be aligned uh, with the demands articulated by the customer. So this is pretty much just a, in a nutshell, if I want to summarize uh, what could be the source of difference coming from your product or service. So now the strategy. So as we had uh, so far, we had the vision market noise for differentiators. We talked about what needs to be turned into. But then this is actually the first template uh, you will need to fulfill as part of your homework. It's all about what I just uh, mentioned to you before. There is nothing new. First of all, you need to create the purpose of your company, articulate in two, three sentences. Again, guys, this is the internal version. Of course, if you have marketing ways, if you have marketing people around you and you can have a nice and shiny version of your uh, purpose, vision, and mission, I'm happy with that. 
But if you, so it's not about uh, playing with the words. It's more about playing with the content. Okay, so if it may be your mission will not uh, sound like perfectly. It's not sound like Apple's vision. But if the content is there, which is the most important, then you take the box because this practice, this homework, this internal version of vision, purpose, and mission is all about that. So it's not for your future customers. It's not for sales purposes. Uh, and you don't need to convince me or any of us uh, by your vision because it's more about creating the real deal. And of course, the, the further ones, long-term, how will this succeed? Where will we exist? How will it become? Should be articulated by this way as well. Even if it's one sentence, it should contain the most important points we discussed already. Okay, this template, of course, will be available uh, in in the uh, in the group folders. Uh, so, pilot as a sales potential. So, let me uh, just highlight one of uh, the possible, uh, let's say, source of your first customers and first revenue. Uh, of course, the pilot is a, is a risky thing. Let me let me tell you in advance. So, if you are not handling well, managing well, it can be a huge, let's say, loss of money, energy. Uh, and of course, confidence. Uh, so, you know, whenever you have the opportunity to make interview with decision makers, that's also serving one other aim besides that you are getting proper information and insights and all these kind of things can be done by the interview and of course, validate your product and service. But it's also a connection, I mean, a lead generation for further connections. So you then uh, can turn back to that uh, that uh, that person uh, and and continue the negotiation. That hey, we had the interview. Now we have the product. We will be happy to show you, etc. And pilot can be so. In usually, you know, hospitals, uh, healthcare providers, uh, pharmaceutical companies, everybody likes to have a pilot uh, because pilot is a kind of you know, it's it's a middle way. So. Uh, they like the product, but they are not confident enough or they are not convinced enough uh, to make a contract. Uh, also, from their management perspective, risk-taking is not that likely. So, again, getting back to the personas, people would, especially, you know, multinational companies, so employees, just think about employees. They need to reserve their seats. They are not having any type of risk, which is risking their seats. So, they will not go into a decision right after so pilot is something which is quite comfortable for them because uh, of course there are many types of pilot. Some of them are paid. In most, in most of the occasions are not paid, unfortunately, because uh, this is a demonstration, a live demonstration of your product service towards your potential customers. And now here are the hints because now you are getting into something that's the play with the majority of the cases. So actually non-paid pilot. You are burning resources, money, energy to show your future customer that you are good. Your solution and uh, your service is, is, is absolutely something which they want, uh, but it can be also, again, so if you are not managing in a proper uh, version, a proper frame, then it can take lots and it can take more than you can actually get back from the potential customer. So first version uh, where you can limit uh, the resources you are burning for, for a pilot, a fixed timeline. So actually you need to, in advance, uh, you need to, the, to make an agreement with your potential customer that which is the time frame or the duration uh, you would like to run the pilot for. You should choose wisely because it's one thing that you would like to save time, resources, money. But the other thing is that actually uh, you should, you, you want to demonstrate uh, how your product or solution is good. So if, of course, it's, it's, really, it's really based on the profile of your service. So if your experience show that in one month, all the users within the company can try out your product, can have a real life experience, a hands-on experience with your product, and it can convince them uh, that it's better than the, than the uh, current solution or something which is done by different uh, workarounds or something, then one month can be enough, but maybe you need more time. So you need to have the minimum time frame which you can generate a positive customer experience with. So that's the thing you need to uh, you need to definitely uh, think about and consider. So then the unclear ROI. So that's important that it can be avoided. So return of investment again. Uh, 
so if you are just having the pilot without at least having the chance to continue the, the contract, uh, uh, but of course in a paid version, then it's something you can definitely uh, uh, consider as a possible risk. So there are different uh, uh, methodologies, different uh, solutions, and of course it's highly dependent on your on your partner you are running the pilot with. But it's highly advised that if it's possible, create a contract for the pilot, which is and there there, there are many occasions which is where, where where it's working that if the customer is satisfied, like in two months' time, and they are not uh, they, uh, they are not terminating the contract in the two months' time, then after the third month. It's automatically continuing, but in a paid version. So that's the pretty straightforward version. That's the best way you can achieve. At least try it. Okay. So nine from your uh, ten from I mean nine from the ten potential customers you would like to make a pilot with the say no for this. But if only one is saying yes, you have a good uh, position. The other is that at least if they are not getting into this version. At least you need to settle in advance that what would be the base of measurements. So you need to, it's important, you need to manage expectations in advance. The worst case you can go into that there is no clear expectation because you, you then have no real thing you can fight with or you can argue with or you can convince. Because if there is no uh, articulated, uh, let's say, measurement result or result they would like to achieve by the pilot, then it's, it's really hard to say, hey, it's a good result or a bad result, because there is no real aspect to it. So uh, agree on the results you would like to, I mean, they would like to achieve during the pilot. Uh, and then, of course, agree on the, on the timeline that when the pilot is ending, um, you know, just around it, maybe after it, maybe before it, uh, you are already having a scheduled two hours uh, uh, meeting where you are demonstrating the results. Uh, and of course, you are proving that every expectation which has been articulated by the company somehow managed or achieved. And then uh, having, let's say, uh, as a, also an expectation, but from your side this time, uh, to have a proper time frame, at least 10 minutes uh, during this two hours call or a separate call or whatever, but having a clear indication that you, I mean, they and you should have uh, talk about uh, the continuation of the cooperation. So uh, your partner, so pilot partner should have a clear view that whenever the pilot is done, they need to tell something to it. It's not about it. Hey, we had the pilot, it was nice. So thank you for it and shake hand and see you next time because then you really spend your time, money, and energy uh, for demonstrating purposes. Guys, it's important to know that, of course, in many times, this cooperation will not continue after the pilot. So this is the optimistic scenario, which, again, always also true, uh, that, that sometimes, yeah, you will have a continuation. But if not, you should not consider it as a failure. But think about what other benefits you can pull off from this cooperation. First, of course, testimonials, references, and also uh, further actually recommendations. So at least have you know, a nice saying from the, from the director or the highest uh, uh, positioned uh, officer in that company uh, uh, having an official statement how they were satisfied about your product. At least you should have this. So if nothing else, you should leave the pilot by this. Of course, maybe they can you know, introduce to other people. You should talk about it. So these are all, and getting back to, the, to my re-original point, personas. So if you can uh, touch these people on a personal level, then actually you can have further recommendations, references, or at least a testimonial. So that's, that's the minimum, let's say, benefit you can, you can get from the, from, the, uh, from the pilot, of course, if it's going well budget constraints. So actually, uh, this is what from the functional uh, basis, uh, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can always uh, have let's say indication on prices, but you should be careful in advance because whenever you have the pilot, not just the client or the partner is learning uh, about your product, but you are also learning them. What are their demands? How intensive uh, intense their work is? Uh, how pushy they are, 
how demanding they are. Uh, of course, you cannot rely on 100% because because people are changing in positions. Maybe there will be a new demanding leader, etc. So that's that's something which is a, a nice extra. But at least you will have a picture how much resources you would need to maintain the service in a paid version. And by this, it's more wise to talk about the price whenever the time is coming. So after the pilot, because otherwise it's, it can make them, of course, on a price level, they should have uh, uh, a picture in their head because you know that's also can be a risk <clears throat> that they are thinking that you are serving you know, a few hundreds of euros per month and it's revealing that it's uh, 20,000 euros and they say, oh my God, this, that's, that's just impossible. Of course, for these kind of partners, you should not start a pilot with, but exact pricing should be defined uh, whenever uh, you're done with the pilot phase. Before that, the level of price, of course, can be, can be communicated and can be talked through with the pair with the partner and feature restrictions so that that's that's also an option uh for uh for making them you know uh aware of your product uh making them try out your product but not uh giving them any, every uh feature and every uh possibilities or options within your within your uh, solution so that can be of course it's mainly for digital health solutions where you can, features can be restricted. Of course, sometimes it's MedTech is also working, but uh, more likely it's for digital health solutions, uh, but uh, it can be also communicated through the application. It's like, yes, in a full version, you can try out this and that function. So that, that can be uh, also interesting to kind of generate the demand during the pilot because you know we are all humans. So whenever there is an option, which is sounds like good, you will push on it. And if you have the message that if you are you know, getting into the full price version, you will be, you will, in most of the cases, you will be curious, you will be interested. And you should, we should not, I mean, in case of B2C, it's of course your money, but in case of B2B, it's important uh, to not to forget about that people are kind of playing with others' money. So they are not that sensitive if they're saying, hey, it's uh, more, 1,000 euro more if you want to have this feature. If they have the budget, again, getting back to the reservation of seats. So if their seat is not uh, sensitive for that 1,000 euros, they will spend that 1,000 euros because it's not their money. Uh, so it's all about you know, convincing them in a smart way. And feature restriction can be also, again, a smart solution to not to give everything during the pilot, but making them interested in the full version. So recommended metrics, and that's important again, getting back and these metrics, what I will uh, show you uh, mostly applicable for digital health solutions. Uh, some of them are also medtech, but, but again, mostly for digital health. Uh, so it's important, and these are just examples. Uh, the, the most important point that I would like to raise your attention to you is always having the expectation established between you and the pilot partner. So actually agree on what you are measuring how you are measuring and what is the result they are looking for. Because other than that, it's you know it's just argument. It's back and forth. Who is satisfied in which way? So uh, maybe your your negotiation partner is just having a bad day, and they think, oh yeah, it's it's just not necessary. It's not essential. So go forward. But if you have facts in your hand that hey, you said you would like to have this and that, we achieved. It's clearly showing that our solution can be a great help for you. Now that's an objective base for further negotiations. It's not emotional. It's not about how you wake up that morning. It's about facts and figures. And this is what you're looking for. This is your pure intention. Uh, so recommended metrics for, for uh, digital health solution. How many people have uh, logged uh, in during the pilot to the application? How many active users do you have or did you have during the pilot? How many valued activities did those folks perform? How can you translate these figures into actual value for the company? Again, it's uh, price saving or cost saving or uh, additional sales. So guys, this is the only way, two ways, uh, where, where how the companies can actually generate extra financial benefits, saving costs or generating extra money. Those, from those two, you need to decide which is applicable for you, but for sure, everything can be translated at least into one category. Uh, how many new leads did you generate over the pilot? What is the estimated close rate and the overall contract value? Cost savings over what, uh, what the client was using before your solution 
and time savings that translates into even greater value. So the last two, again, time cost savings, but time saving is also cost saving, don't forget. Okay, just a quick example. So actually, uh, Seneca Global is, uh, uh, is a uh, German, Austrian, Hungarian company. Uh, they, as you can see, uh, they were been established in 2000, actually 2018, they had been established, but whenever they had a tangible MVP prototype, it was 2019, this company uh, created great, great, is actually uh, uh, an automatized tool for helping radiologists to create their, their reports. So actually it's an AI uh, based or AI driven solution, uh, which is helping radiologists to get into the, the proper content. If you are familiar with this uh, field, yeah, I mean, this is not only for radiologists, but mostly for all medical reports that most of the content is pretty a template can be templatized uh, because these are pretty standard content. Uh, and they are always, I mean, in the old practice, they need to create each and every report by their own, one by one from scratch. And GRADE is helping them by actually, uh, in a visual way, uh, selecting uh, the type of content they would like to put into the report. They are this quiet, uh, quiet sensitive and, uh, and adaptive and different type of content. They are shrinking it down and actually the report. So the standard content parts can be implemented by one click. So by instead of creating every report from scratch, it's a modular based AI driven solution, uh, which, is, which, is, uh, uh, which is helping to reduce uh, the reporting duties of their uh, radiologist. Also, it has a quick translator. So uh, the content, because that's also an important uh, uh, barrier that uh, the radiologist reports, usually medical reports in general, are created in the local language. But if you are traveling to somewhere, you have an accident and you, won't, you, you would need that radiologist report. You are getting into a translator, a professional translator. You're waiting days, you are paying money. But by this solution, now it's working with four different languages. Actually, the radiologist report can be translated by one click. So that's, that's of course, the smartest solution. So they participated in Inostar's Life 2019. and 2020, actually, one of the co-founders become part of the, I'm sorry uh, for my Swiss, is Universitatsspital Zurich. I hope yeah, I pronounced it well. Uh, so actually one of the biggest uh, university hospital in Zurich. Uh, and he started also to, to work as a radiologist, a part-time radiologist, um, and also offered uh, their solution to, the, uh, to his workplace. Uh, and in 2020, they ran a pilot solution, a pilot, sorry, uh, with, the, with the hospital. And as the hospital was so satisfied with the solution, they actually, at the same year, acquired them as a first customer. So that's a success story. I'm not saying that every time it's so linear. I'm saying that in many cases, that can work very well. And in the other cases, you are collecting a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, testimonials, references, network, etc. So there is no pilot which is ending up with no results. The, the question is based on your preparation. Okay, and if you're prepared well for your pilot, at least some values can be, uh, can be generated by of it. Okay, so essentials of KPIs. Oh, can you give me, sir, just one minute? Uh, Justina, can we go beyond the time limit? Or uh, of course, if all of you agree with that, so I don't want to steal your time. Uh, so for me, it doesn't matter. It's about your and the people's time. So um, yeah. and maybe if people have some questions to you so far, they can ask if they really need to run now. Um, so you can maybe make a pause here and then whoever wants to stay, uh, they are happy to stay. Whoever wants to go uh, and needs to go, recording will be available uh, in the shared folder. Okay, okay, that's that's fine. For me, it's absolutely fine. Sorry, guys, I'm usually pretty bad in time management. And as you can see, we have other topics to talk about. Uh, so whoever uh, is interested in and having the opportunity to, to stay, 
I would I would ask for staying. Of course, if you have other things to do or uh, in time pressure, please feel free to leave. And of course, the recording you can watch back. Uh, and yes, just one minute uh, because this is allergy season, so I'm suffering from that. So just one minute, and I'm getting back. I'm here. So, any questions regarding the, uh, the the points I just mentioned before? Okie dokie. Then we are going forward. So, KPIs. Uh, this is one of your uh, most hated and most beloved parts. Oh, there is a chat message. I'm just checking here. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, KPIs are a pain in the ass, so I can tell you. But uh, again, getting back to my previous point, how measurement is so important. So KPIs should be your best friends at the same time. Because uh, if you, I mean, KPI is helping you to see in, a, in an objective way uh, about the things you did, uh, about the actions you carried out. Uh, because if you do not have the KPIs, you just have a gut feeling. Of course, if your business is going well, uh, you can have the feeling, oh, I should not have KPIs because my KPI is income. So, you know, I'm ha having a great revenue, uh, a nice salary. I can hire new people. So business is going well. Yes, it's true. Short term, maybe you can live without KPIs. But if you do not know why you are doing it well, what are the, let's say, uh, business uh, aspects you are doing really well, and that is why your revenue, your income, your business is good, then you cannot replicate it on the future. Or if something is getting into your wheels, then you cannot really get out of it because you don't know actually how you did and what are the things you're doing well, what needs to be improved and where your performance may be poor at the moment as well. So that's why KPI is a good monitoring tool or monitor, of course, tool is, is maybe a bad term for that. So uh, KPI, is something you definitely need to express for yourself and then measure it back. So whoever is not uh, having, uh, let's say, uh, familiar or relation with, <laughs> with KPIs, so KPIs are the key performance indicators. These are the quantitative ones I'm mostly talking about. Because of course, we are talking about qualitative and quantitative uh, KPIs. Uh, the qualitative is much more for the major uh, uh, part of your journey. First, we should talk about the quantitative. So something which you can measure. Giving you an example, you are doing a marketing campaign, generating new leads. Your target is getting 10 new connections with, with uh, potential customers. It's quite easy to measure back. Did we have those 10 contacts or we just had eight or we just had zero? So that's something which is pretty easy to judge. The qualitative part is much more complex and it's reflecting back the old part of your business. So first, Let's focus on the quantitative ones. And of course, KPI is also a predecessor for other activities. So why you are not having, and it's getting back to my original saying, why you are not having the objectives and the expected results, not because of the pilot, for a pilot, but also for your business as usual, daily routine, you should not start any type of activities. You should have clear for yourself that what is the expected results you are going for. Uh, and of course, again, just sticking to my silly example, 10 new leads, you have eight. It's not tragic. It's good. It's close to that. But of course, you need to decide because it's based on what amount of money, energy, and other resources you actually burned about it. Maybe it's, again, it's, again, really relative. Maybe you have two new, uh, 10 new, uh, I mean, eight new contacts instead of the 10, but you spent 2,000, I mean, uh, 20,000 euros. It's maybe it's not a well, uh, it's a quite good ratio. Maybe you spent 500 euros and of course 10 new contacts is really nice, but it's everything is based on your financial situation, what amount of money you can generate or you have other options to, to generate leads. So if you are talking about a certain marketing activity, you can also compare with others. 
And this is where KPI are also helping you because if you can say, hey, this activity cost us 10,000 euros, we generated five leads instead of the other, which cost us 500 euros and we generated four course ratio by, it's, it's, you can easily choose at the moment, which is better for you. Maybe at a certain point of time, uh, that one you are selecting is, is uh, reaching the extension point. Uh, then you need to select another one. But making decisions on a daily basis, KPI is also a huge help for you. Okay, um, moving forward, if I can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is the main questions you need to also raise whenever you are actually defining your KPIs. So first of all, what objectives will help me achieve my strategy? What key milestones should I focus on this year, this quarter? What are my customers, partners, and board demanding? Board, of course, can be totally different from your customers. Maybe their demand is, usually it's highly financial focused, of course. What activities are critical to success? Which are the distractions? And of course, it's important to say that KPI should go from top to the bottom. So you should not, uh, so these kind of, you know, high level objectives, I also hope uh, pointed out by my questions should be answered and should be uh, come from the top to the bottom. KPIs are different, yeah, this is, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, I don't want to go into details. Of course, you will know, have these presentations beside uh, the recording. Uh, these are typical, uh, let's say, KPIs, uh, which is, which is uh, widely known, widely, widely used by companies. So you can also have some inspiration out of it. Uh, and of course, you can, some of them you can directly use for your own purposes. Okay, and this is actually uh, what you would need to think about. This is not the homework. I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, raising as a, as a possible uh, internal uh, practice you can follow uh, that actually defining the five most important KPIs for yourself. Okay, and operating plans and priorities. So if you remember, actually also your homework will focus on these points. So long-term goals, who will we become, where will we exist and how will we succeed? But then, and this is the next step, this is not your homework, this is definitely just for your own purposes internally. And of course, uh, based on different maturity levels, different type of action plans should be created. But as you can see, based on the outcome of your homework or for your internal practice, you can create the product and engineering plan, sales, partnerships and channel plan, marketing and positioning plan, pricing, operations and financial plan, geo expansion, interna internationalization plan, again, different maturity level, credibility and investment plan, culture and resources plan, and customer experience and delight plan. Of course, the second part of the list, again, so from the geo expansion, is definitely for more major startups, thinking about expanding their activity within or outside of Europe, but all others, so the first four, is something which you definitely need to, of course, maybe you don't have an engineering plan, but a product development plan, definitely you should have a vision where you want to develop your product further on. Okay, so these are the type of plans you can translate it from, uh, from the output of your homework. Okay, plans, you know, guys, just uh, these, most of the, these points are really straightforward. Um, so plans, and this is a full statement first, are where most people start unfortunately, because plans are the bottom. So you should start with the top, the objectives, the strategic plan. Uh, I mean, all of these kind of high level desires, and then it should be translated to plans. So you should not start with the plans. So plans are tactical, are tied to KPIs or should have tied to KPIs. Unfortunately, that's not always true, but, uh, but again, keep, I try to push really this message that how KPIs are important. Plans are supporting the strategy. Of course, they are coming out from the strategy. Uh, so that should be back and forth. Uh, plans are time bound. Uh, plan should have an owner. That's important uh, in the second part of your homework. I will tell you later on. Uh, have a cost and have an ROI. So all these things are again, straightforward, but are the essential rules for plans. And this is actually the second homework template you will have. So, it's a kind of, let's say, marketing action plan. Let's go this way. Because uh, it's not that low level, 
but it's not strategy. So it's somewhere in the middle. First of all, uh, so you should, I mean, I'm coming from the, uh, the bottom now because marketing priorities. So what type of marketing actions and what type of desired outcomes you would like to have? Of course, uh, so there are two ways, usually teams are doing it. Uh, if you have, uh, let's say, a more diversified uh, company, so actually can have different owners uh, for different marketing activities, then one sheet is one marketing activity. If you have, you know, a smaller team, then marketing activities and priorities can be listed each and uh, each other's uh, below. Uh, so that can be also like a summary sheet for all marketing activities and priorities. Timing is pretty straightforward. Of course, high level timing is enough saying, hey, 2022 Q4, we would like to do this and that. Uh, so owners, it's important then to, to start with the, or to continue with the headline. So owners, uh, this should be differentiated uh, by different roles, but also people. So if you uh, pretty much uh, able to, to name them, that would be also important. Uh, a, a task or any type of, uh, any type of uh, practice without an owner is just not existing. So you definitely need to, uh, to name that person who will be not just responsible, but accountable for that task. So actually, uh, yeah, you should name them. Uh, KPIs, we already discussed it. I don't want to press you, push it again. And dependencies, it's important that the predecessors should be named here. So what are the, uh, let's say, the dependencies, what are, what are the uh, enablers uh, for uh, each and every activities you are about to launch or you are planning to have launched? So, and the audiences, that's important that you can see, of course, here the purchasers, users, influencers, and enablers. Now we are only focusing on those fools, uh, but here, try to be as punctual as possible. So uh, within that X, XYZ company, we'd like to go for the purchaser. If you know the name, it's even better, but, but of course, uh, at least on a role level, you should be specific. So that's the second part of your homework. Uh, of course, uh, I already mentioned to you, but I'm just repeating it, that if you need any help during the creation of your homework, uh, as well as you have any questions regarding the topic itself, please let me know. That's another, uh, you, you will have this template uh, for your homework, but I'm just showing you that there is another kind of structure uh, which can be also used very well, not a big deal, it's a different structure for the same purpose. Uh, it's just an example, I don't want to go into details, you will receive the presentation and, and you know, we already discussed uh, the the uh, the points where we should be placed here. Okay, okay, this is just an example. Yeah, guys, questions <laughs> before moving forward. Okie doke. If not, moving forward. Yeah, Justina, please. No, I just mean if someone uh, would like to ask questions without being recorded, I am going. Oh, are you, are you, are you still continuing the webinar? Yes, 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 yes. Do you know how long it's it's going to take? <laughs> At four o'clock, <laughs> we will finish. I promise. So okay. twenty more minutes. <laughs> I okay, try got to it. as quick as possible. Maybe it's 10, 15 minutes. I can do. Uh, so uh, yeah. Uh, you know, you okay. maybe next time we can we can schedule two hours because it seems to be that, that maybe it's because of me, but yeah, it's 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 so much content. <laughs> sure, I'm not gonna keep you uh, any. I will try to be as uh, fast as possible. Okay, so uh, the funnel. So that's important that that's your let's say the journey of your customers. So the funnel itself is actually the different stages uh, in the life cycle of the relationship with your customer. That's the most precise uh, term uh, for the funnel. So actually, and of course, it's, uh, if, we, if it's uh, designed well, it's also describing that each and every stage 
what type of action you should do in order to maximize the satisfaction of the customer. First of all, of course, uh, to, to get uh, them on board and then make them happy and you know, stay with them as long as possible. That's pretty much the funnel's uh, role uh, in the whole process. So you see uh, the most important rules here, no obsolete. So everything could be adapted and customized by your purposes. Uh, make it run smoothly for scale. Uh, so that's important that whenever you're done and you can see here that actually after the purchase, we are not done. So after they purchase your product, the real account management is starting. So actually having, the, I mean, having them on board is just, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a state for that minute, for that hour, that day. But for keeping them for long term, the, making them happy and maybe creating upsell because it's also part of this package that if you are at, you know, uh, in, a, in a pharmaceutical company, a healthcare provider, a hospital, maybe you are thinking about uh, in the same solution, the same service or product, new features, uh, new type of, uh, of add-ons they can still buy. So actually that can be a, a, a subject of the upsell, but maybe you're also uh, uh, planning to have other solutions in your portfolio. Then if you are in somewhere having a nice relationship, I don't need to, I believe, stretch it out how much easier to sell them the new product than starting a new relationship. Actually, there are calculations within the marketing world that how much easier to add to, how, how much easier and cheaper to keep a customer compared to acquire a customer. So definitely keeping a, keeping a customer on board, it's cheaper, easier, not always easier, but, but kind of easier, uh, but definitely smoother and cheaper. So as, as much you can, you should keep all your customers who already been acquired. Okay, so then uh, whenever you are pretty familiar with that funnel, that it should be known, simplified and shortened if it's possible. Um, as I mentioned to you, it doesn't end at the purchase and um, the acquisition is one thing, but again, account management, so keeping the, the, the customers, uh, sometimes it's more time effective, but it's resulting and it's good thing that uh, at the end of the day, it's a really avoiding process uh, instead of uh, acquiring <clears throat> new and new customers every time. Uh, and of course, for different stages, different KPIs should be, should be attached. Okay, educate, educate and acquire. I will just quickly run through it. Uh, so of course, many methods are here. It's important that, that there are so many solutions in the health tech market uh, and people cannot keep uh, up with it. So uh, they don't know what are the new things. Uh, so they should be really clear on their messages. Uh, again, they should, I mean, uh, especially in case of B2B uh, solutions, you, you should have the direct connection with your customers, having the detailed talk, not necessarily on the technical details, but, but the differentiators uh, compared to your competitors. Uh, so it's important that whenever you are uh, trying to, uh, to get in touch with a new customer, of course, there are many uh, well-known uh, channels like direct emails, direct calls, etc. Uh, if you are, for instance, uh, looking for, and this is also applicable for B2C, if you want to, uh, to shoot with a big, I mean, you, you for some reason, again, I highly recommend to, to make the, uh, the uh, so creating actually the personals and messaging up onto that. But if you are not able to do with all of your potential customers and you, for some reason, you are deciding to bombard them with direct emails, you can still have the A-B test. I'm not sure how you're familiar with that, but it's all about that actually in a shorter sample, like 20, uh, maybe your, your, you know, your, your surroundings or maybe already existing customers, you can run A-B testing, meaning that content tool wise and design wise, you're sending them to different type of newsletter, for instance, or just a direct email. And then you are measuring by the results. And it's clear, and, and of course, the sample you're using should have correlation, uh, age, uh, education level, et cetera. But other than that, these are two different samples. Um, and, uh, and you can run the A to B, A, A, B test and see the results. And based on the results, of course, you can choose whichever is better for your purposes and delivering better results. Uh, so it's important 
that even when, even though you are using passive type of communication to your potential customers, there should be always a call to action button, call to action message, something which is just not telling you, hey, we are here or our solution is great. Cool, so what? It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't uh, automatically ring the bell if you do not have the interaction surface. So actually, if you have a direct conversation with decision makers, of course, it's not that stage, not the uh, situation, because uh, you can have, you can formulate the next steps, you can agree on something, so that's different. But especially if you're advertising yourself, for instance, in an online uh, platform, just think about a banner. A banner is always having something, you know, just click on this and you will receive that. Uh, or at least, you know, we are the best, click for more details. So something which is making you click on that banner because otherwise it's just a message. It's not making you interacting uh, with the solution. Okay, convert. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's actually from the, from the interest, uh, converting them to, to real deal. That's one of the, I believe, most difficult phase uh, in a classic funnel. Uh, so it's important, you know, again, the, the, the customization of messaging. So as you can see, uh, how do they behave? What convinces them? Listen, scope, research. These are all about their triggers. It's all about making the personas uh, beyond the customers. So buy, of course, is again, purchasing cycles. So you need to be familiar what are the technical details and the frame of their purchasing method. Uh, so that, that is the most important message here. Buy more, buy again. So again, account management. Uh, so whenever it's, of course, it's up to that we are talking about a subscription-based model. We are talking about a one-time deal when we are talking about uh, uh, a renting service, etc. So, but it's important that you should have a proper view on your customers. In case of B2C, I mean, in case of B2B and B2C, CRM is important, but especially in case of B2C, it's really important to track uh, your individual customers, because you will, in, a, in an optimistic scenario, you will have a lot of people to, to deal with. In case of B2B, you will more need account managers or actually persons who are taking care about your, your customers, uh, who are making, a, I mean, if of course geographic is possible, uh, making a coffee with your customers time by time, uh, knowing them, what they are looking for, what are their future plans. It's not just about keeping them happy, it's about making uh, your strategy you know, up to date based on your client's demands. And it also can have a lot of inputs to your product development, because if it's clear that they need something else, something new, something which is not existing maybe in your portfolio, then it can be a subject of your product development. So it's important that, that you can have a lot of inputs by having a nice account management. Satisfaction, dissatisfaction. So again, uh, account management is kind of resolving this issue, uh, but just by knowing if they are happy and when they are not happy. Because if you know uh, they are not happy, you still have the chance to, to reverse this whole situation. If you do not know anything about it, then you will have just a contract termination message after a while. So it's important uh, that, the, and of course, just always think about the factors. So whenever you have uh, a dissatisfied customer or maybe a sum, uh, never ever to go, go to, the, to the direction that what, how is their fault? Because maybe that's the truth, but you will not uh, have any type of you know, benefits out of it. So you always need to check yourself and what are the things you can change? Uh, and even though they are not right, they are your customers, they are paying for you. So you can only change on the things you are responsible for. Uh, so that's, that's the main, uh, let's say, focus on that leakage. Um, of course, if you see that, especially for B2C, it's applicable so, uh, that you are saying, okay, my subscribers are just disappearing without any notification, without uh, you know, having any type of negative reviews, they are just leaving. Uh, and of course, you need to analyze it. So leakages are well, so you need to, of course, uh, for most of you, it's quite straightforward. Uh, if you're constantly analyze your, your statistics, you will be on time to see if there is a leakage. And you need to analyze uh, that why, uh, why do they disappear? Uh, why do they lose their interest? Maybe there is no, not enough content refreshment, uh, which is keeping them uh, updated. Uh, so all these kind of factors should be analyzed uh, that part. Measure is just, you know, uh, 
just a quick example you can use further on. Okay, now healthcare marketing. Guys, I just want to go really through. Uh, yeah, I can, I can keep the 10 minutes for sure. So I just check the time. <laughs> Even though I'm really bad at it, so uh, so yeah, uh, the important uh, in healthcare marketing that the the healthcare related special conditions should be considered. It's like the different uh, different regulations, reimbursement system, expectations uh, from the companies. Uh, so this is actually if you are talking about of, or if you are talking about with uh, or talking with sorry the general public or the B two B public, there is a trust gap uh, which you will also need to face. Just think about. Uh, just think about uh, some of the cases recently we had. Just think about the Theranos story in the U.S. That made, even though it's one time example coming from the U.S., uh, it made a significant trust gap uh, in Europe and in the U.S. as well towards biotech products. So uh, because there was a huge trust, maybe a too much trust, and they just failed. Uh, and we know how they failed. So it's not that epic, let's go this way. Uh, so actually, all these kind of things we will face with, uh, but as healthcare professionals, of course, most of these uh, things can be handled easily, quite easily. Uh, still, the business-related points uh, you need to focus on uh, from the healthcare marketing and, and sales perspective. So actually, there are two types of, there is one categorization. Of course, there are others like ATL, BTL, above the line, below the line. But there's another, it's inbound and outbound. So passive and active, we can call it simple as that. Uh, so inbound, as you can see, some of the uh, examples here, so blogging, thought leadership, the social media part on an organic way, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, so the app store uh, positioning, uh, the SEO, the PPC, the email opt-in, community building. So all these kind of, kind of indirect passive ways. And of course, there are the outbound, which is more active and time and energy and money consuming. Those are the broadcast, print advertising, paid social media, email to purchase list. Of course, LinkedIn hunting, cold calls, display advertising. So these are the things which is, I'm not saying that, especially the early stage should not use, but this is something where you need more competence. I mean, uh, compared to the inbound, uh, more competence and more money, of course. And more people at the end of the day, but if you have more money, you have to have more more people. So that's that's pretty straightforward. So digital digital marketing uh, today and not today. Uh, not today. It's for more major startups. So you know, for for the more major startups from the audience, of course, it's only for today for you. But oh, it's also today for you. But for especially for earlier stage startups, having less money, less competence for marketing, and less people. The, those are the most proposed uh, uh, tools. So inbound SEO keywords, uh, the SEO uh, like P and PPC, the content blogging, uh, referral, and of course, word of mouth. The outbound part, social media, public relations, collateral, can be also handled by a little bit more money, but not that amount of money. We are talking about the not today group. <clears throat> so search engine optimization. I don't want to go into details. I believe that you are, we are pretty familiar with that. It's all about keywords. It's all about how we are positioning from the search engines uh, point of view, uh, our, our product, our keywords, our website. So all kind of messages we would like to broadcast towards our customers. Keywords here. So this is what I mentioned to you. It's important that you will see that there are different types of H1, H2, H3 tags. So based on the, on the smart, uh, selection of words in different stages or layers of your website or your online products uh, can be accessible by your by your potential customers can be a great result from the search engines. So it's it's really uh, up to you and it's really based on the, the continuous research and maintaining your keywords. Uh, that should take time uh, and, of course, a professional competence. But the good news is that if you're doing well, it's not money consuming. Uh, the free tools you can use for this purpose, and I can, I, can, uh, uh, I can recommend it. This is the Google Search Console and the Uber Suggest. Okay, keywords like, uh, so this is what I mentioned to you. So H1, H2, H3 tags with the yellow, you can find the most important ones. So these are the layers. Uh, for web and marketing content, you should be really careful by, uh, by selecting the most important keyword. 
Okay, so uh, the app uh, app store optimization, so SAO. Uh, so actually, you know, this is for digital health companies, of course, only. Um, as you can see in the US, US research, the, the second most important selection criteria people are actually selecting their choice of application was the positioning in the app store. So well, it was positioned, decided that the people will use or not. Uh, so that's important that if you are in digital health business, the app, uh, uh, app store optimization is something which is really, really important. There are two types uh, of, let's say, reputation uh, influences. One, of course, is the title and keywords, again, getting back to search engine optimization, and the other is downloads and ratings. Uh, of course, on ratings and reviews, I don't want to recommend any unethical ways, but we all know that many of the reviews on an application, it's not based on pure customers, uh, but actually people who is around the application. So as we said the first time, it's not uh, that lousy, it's not that uh, it's not that cheating, so please feel free to use in my view. Uh, tools, so it's a mobile dev HQ, app tweak or app any, these can also work, uh, these can also work for you and help you. Okay, PPC, this is the pay per click. Uh, so actually, uh, it also it's applicable for social media. So pay per click originally condition uh, how you are paying for your advertisement. So whoever is paying to your advertisement will generate you a cost and of course an awareness at the, at the, at the positive side. So PPC is generally uh, that actually online advertisements. So the ad rank is based on the bid uh, you are uh, connecting to that advertisement. So actually the money, the amount of money uh, and the quality score. So actually how much, uh, so based on the feedbacks and based on the uh, click-ons uh, that can be, sorry, yeah. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Thank you for being with us and sorry for this uh, late, uh, of course, whoever, so guys, for all others, uh, if you have uh, time to run, please do so. Uh, I will finish in three, four minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sorry for uh, having to go. No worries, no worries, much. absolutely understand it. Thank you okay. for being with us. Bye-bye, thank, bye. thank you. Bye -bye. So content marketing, pretty straightforward, creating something which is interesting for people. So that's important that also you should have a small research. If you are seeing LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, wherever, uh, you can find professional topics which is connected to your product. It's not direct advertisement. It's not about why they should buy your product. It's all about uh, the, the topic itself, which can be interesting. It's also good for startups who are not having the product on the market because you can start to build a community around your product, uh, around your service. And then actually you can activate that community whenever you are in the market. So building a community based on uh, useful content, which can be interesting for, your, uh, for the target group or people nearby your target group can be a really good point. Um, okay, this is the periodical table of digital marketing. I, uh, it's, it's really uh, interesting and a good summary. So you can use it further on. Of course, we will not go into details now. Uh, belonging and thought leadership, that's connected to the content marketing, but that's something, so if you have a nice number of uh, following people uh, personally, so it's not about your company, uh, and whenever we are talking about content marketing, I would highly uh, recommend not to blog or create content uh, on the, the profile of your company, but your, your, pro, well, your personal profile, because that's also important that Again, by organic content, you can create a community which can be activated later on or by paid campaigns, you can also extend it. Social media, guys, straightforward. Uh, it's important that, uh, that there's a saying that organic is dead. Yes, I can agree with that. So buy just organic. So if you are having a direct advertising intention, then just purely organic content is not enough. But again, you can build a community uh, in a longer term. So it's not taking years, but not like a two days campaign or one week campaign or two weeks campaign. It's a little bit more time, uh, but by this way, organic in my view is not dead, but for purely advertising purposes, 
you need to be prepared that all the paid campaigns can work. But it's important to know, again, getting back to, to the essentials we learned today, or I just talked about today, uh, is that you should have the clear objective what you would like to achieve by social media advertisements. But just by, by being there, uh, you know, seeing our advertisement is just luxury. So be careful with that. Okay, uh, and the marketing rig. Quickly, uh, loyalty and referrals. So whenever you have B2C, B2B customers, of course, you can uh, offer them. If they are uh, you know, referring other people, if they are bringing new customers, then they can have different type of discounts, different type of uh, other benefits. Uh, so that can really work well. Uh, it's important to mention that social media still the best working campaigns are loyalty and referral programs and price promotions, meaning that if you are sharing this uh, you know, post, uh, then and then will be a, a kind of selection of winners, you can win, I don't know, uh, an iPad. So even if it's really you know, the simplest thing ever, uh, this was one of the first marketing tool in social media ever developed, it's still the best working ones. So if you see the numbers, this is still working well. Uh, mechanics, so this is again, uh, if you are referring something, uh, if you are sharing something, what will happen? So if you, are, if you can make your customers, beside the service, a little bit more satisfied and engaged, then it can, they can work instead of you or on your behalf. So these kind of mechanics should be thought well. And as you can see on the right side, this is the simple uh, kind of mechanism which can be followed in the planning phase. Word of mouth, again, recommendation. So of course, a satisfied customer is always, um, always a huge value. Uh, so if they can refer to you, if they can recommend you, if they are giving you a testimonial, it's still, all, and of course, if you are having like, you know, if I uh, have the example of Novartis, a high rank officer from Novartis is, is recommending you by testimony, it's a great value. So all these kind of things uh, should be used for, for as part of your message and as part of your content. So these testimonials, referrals, et cetera, can be also used this way or directly if they're recommending to, to somebody else. Okay, Markham collaterals, these are the, you know, just the brushes, everything which is the classic, uh, uh, the classic uh, collaterals, of course, in the online field, and the marketing, we're talking about brushes, leaflets, et cetera. Digital marketing, we are not uh, calling them collaterals, but we also have this really standard set uh, of uh, digital uh, advertising uh, uh, tools like banners, landing page, microsites. So all these kind of things, of course, can be used wherever there is a purpose, again, important. Okay, event. Now we are getting back to the to the events by the post-COVID era. So it's fortunately, it's, all, uh, it's again, a green topic. Uh, it's, you know, the only main message here, don't stand in your booth, okay? So <laughs> if you are in an event, even though you are uh, expecting that people will come to your booth and ask questions, you are also there. Somebody always needs to be there, of course, at least. So empty booth is also bad. But if you are having a team represent, uh, representing the, the, the company, then besides the one person, others should have uh, the time and energy to, look, to walk around, uh, get new others, and, and you know, make new relationships and then make new networking. So that's a networking purpose here. Okay, and next steps, guys, this is just, uh, you will see <clears throat> that, that tools I like tables. So this is something you can also have an inspiration from. Uh, just a quick uh, overview of what we, what we uh, just talked about today. Um, you can also find the templates here, funnels as well. So more templates. This is not for the homework just, but for further uh, uh, utilization as well. So you can also use uh, all of these. And the final message from my side, besides that, I really appreciate that you stay. Really, uh, really thank you for your time. Uh, that if you need anything else, if you need any information regarding this topic or anything else, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn uh, via email or via Justina, and I'm more than happy to help you. So thank you for your time. Sorry for this uh, not too short delay, 35 minutes. Uh, so thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm stopping the recording now.